Hey, Ryan here. Does your company have a commercial or industrial IoT project coming down the pipe? Reach out to Vary and let our world-class specialists in hardware, software, data science, and design bring it to life. You think about things like Earth observation alone and the number of different market sectors that that kind of new information and data serves. It's, uh, it's an incredible new opportunity for the future and tailor-made for small startups. You're listening to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey, brought to you by Vary. In each episode, we have sharp, unfiltered conversations with executives about their IoT journeys, the mistakes they made, the lessons they learned, and what they wish they'd known when they started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Over the Air. IoT Connected Devices and the Journey. Today, we're going to be talking about SPACs, Space, and Space IoT. My guest today, former CEO of Boeing and current CEO of New Vista, Dennis Mullenberg. Dennis, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Ryan. It's great to be with you. Thanks for coming on. So, Dennis, most people know you as a lifer at Boeing. Can you give us a little bit of background on your new adventure? Yeah, you bet. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we did the IPO on a new SPAC called New Vista Acquisition Corp. And uh, we're focused on the emerging technologies of the aerospace and defense sector. So when I look back over the history of aerospace over the last 100 plus years, I think this is the greatest transformation in the history of aerospace. And that's including you know, the jet engine age, the space age, uh, the number of new technologies that are all coming together at once right now and really transforming aerospace is an incredible opportunity. And uh, that's where New Vista is focused. Uh, I totally agree, as you know. You know, going back to to Boeing, and then we'll just catch back up with this space theme. You guys were doing some really cool things that would later be called IoT. I think at the time were referred to more as systems of systems. But you're just bringing the audience kind of up to speed. Can you give a little background on some of the cool projects that you were working on during your time there? And then, like maybe we'll look for some connective tissue through to you know the projects that you're interested in right now. Yeah, Ryan, you know, this this goes back almost uh, 20 years, back when we were working on uh, system of systems programs, as we called it back then. As you said, that was uh, IoT before it was IoT. And uh, one of the big programs we worked on was something called Future Combat Systems. And this was a program for the U.S. Army to try to bring new networking technology and robotic technologies to s- soldiers and to push that out to the tactical edge. And uh, we worked on a number of different systems that would connect soldiers in new ways, new communications gear, robots, both flying and crawling robots that could be controlled in the hands of soldiers out in uh, platoons. All of that connected back to their main tanks and other platforms that they would operate in. All of this uh, networked across about two dozen different systems that were all being developed in parallel, all of which could operate as a cohesive, uh, what we call brigade combat team. So it was fantastic technology in terms of connectivity and and new ways of of operations. And it also brought about new organization structures, operational structures for the U.S. Army. So it's interesting how the technology and the organization structure both kind of transformed together. That that was an awesome effort, really a precursor to a lot of the other system of systems work that's now been done over the last two decades. If I recall, that award was circa 2002, 2003. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, just about 20 years ago. Yep. What would you say, like looking back in the, the years from then to now, what are some of the significant changes you've seen in the connected space? Can you talk a little bit about that arc that like have got you feeling really jazzed about 2021? Well, I think some of the, the trends that we see and are, are continuing to accelerate is increased uh, bandwidth and reliability of connectivity. So you know, as, as now, as we look at the proliferation of, of 5G and, and new levels of connectivity, uh, we look at uh, things like satellite communications technology, which is now very commonplace. Those high bandwidth, high connectivity capabilities are enabling all kinds of new technologies on their own. Vehicles that are connected, people that you can stay connected you know, around the clock, uh, around the world. Uh, all, all of those things are transforming how we live. And uh, it's exciting to see that arc, and, and it's actually not slowing down. It, it's, it's speeding up as we think about uh, new communication technologies for the future. Okay, let's take that, push that thread forward, bring us up to present day. So New Vista, you guys just raised a boatload of money, quarter of a billion, maybe slightly north of that uh, for your SPAC. Your orientation is towards space. 
specifically, as I understand it, space IoT, which is, how, which is the coolest term anyone's ever said on this podcast. What can you tell us about what you guys are, are interested in, focused on? What kinds of things are we going to be seeing out of New Vista? Yeah, well, going back to, to New Vista, when we look at the emerging technologies that are of interest to us, you see things like artificial intelligence, autonomy, uh, new networking technologies, new manufacturing technologies, uh, new propulsion systems, uh, new satellite networks made up of uh, micro satellites and nano satellites. These are sm- much smaller scale network satellites, if you want to use that term of space IoT, connecting thousands and thousands of satellites on orbit. All of those technologies coming together at once are transforming logistics and transportation, things like e-commerce, which are satellite enabled, things like advanced air mobility, flying taxis, which are highly connected machines, again, using space-based communications, areas like next generation defense systems, and then the the foundational transformation of the space ecosystem. You think about low earth orbit, right? 100 miles plus up above the, uh, the surface of the Earth. Today, there's really one destination there, International Space Station. But uh, over the next decade, there's going to be massive growth in, in new destinations, space factories, space tourism, a whole new transportation system to serve that ecosystem, all connected by satellites and communication techniques. All of that creates this new space IoT, and it's transformational. It's, it's going to make low Earth orbit the next big ecosystem. And it's really interesting. One of the things that we often hear from venture capitalists is that the companies doing really interesting things in space have much too long of a time horizon to be like interesting as portfolio companies. It feels like SPACs fill that gap effectively. Is is that your view on it? Yeah, I agree. SPACs are a great uh, new vehicle to help some of these uh, private startup companies mature with with the time skills needed to field new hardware in space and and ultimately become a successful public company. And uh, traditionally, space is is a hardware and software kind of business. VC money often, I'll say, shies away from hardware businesses and tends to focus more on just digital and software. Space business also tends to have higher regulatory burdens, you know, certification for space hardware. If you're going to put humans into space, arguably the most difficult thing that mankind does is, is putting humans in space. But those higher regulatory boundaries you know, also tend to extend the timelines. So sometimes venture capitalists don't have enough patience uh, for those kind of investments, whereas a SPAC can come alongside these private companies, not only be a provider of capital, but also a provider of additional technical depth and operational experience, really a long-term kind of business partner. And, and that's really the business model that we've developed with our new Vista SPAC. So we're, we're looking for great emerging technology space companies, uh, companies who will make this space IoT environment a reality, but they can also use a partner who can bring a strong amount of capital along with technical expertise and operational expertise with a long view of the idea of ultimately producing a successful public company. You know, so some of our listeners out there are uh, probably asking themselves, hey, look, space is the most fascinating thing that you can do. I, the entrepreneur in question, this, you know, fictitious person, am interested in starting a company or directing my company towards space to participate, you know, in this really exciting arena. What advice would you have for a smaller company that wanted to participate in space IoT? What, what are some of the gaps that you think will be there? Maybe a smaller company could be really effective at that, like the larger companies obviously are going to do the huge pieces like the propulsion systems and things like that. But are there gaps that you think if you were advising, you'd say, hey, look, I really think if you focused here, there's some opportunities to, to get in there. Yeah, we, we see several, several evolving space-based markets where small companies are being successful. One is in the, uh, in the launch market and uh, smaller rockets, uh, medium-sized rockets, m- mini rockets, if you will, with smaller payloads. So as uh, satellites get smaller in size, uh, these, these nano satellites and micro satellites I talked about earlier, the size of the rocket to take them into space comes down and is simplified. And, and we're seeing a number of companies that are entering that marketplace with the idea of reducing the, the cost to get to space, breaking the cost curve and thereby increasing access to space. Uh, That's a very lucrative area, and a number of new uh, startups are are being very successful there. 
a second area of interest is in satellite uh, design itself. We have companies who are now 3D printing satellites, designing new, very small scale satellites that are networked with very sophisticated payloads and uh, putting thousands of those on orbit with uh, multiple launches. Again, that's something that the capital and uh, scale of a small company can actually achieve. So that's an exciting area for the future. Then if you think about the services that ride on these uh, networks, these new satellite IoT networks, fabulous uh, variety of companies that are working in in that area on things like Earth observation, new reconnaissance and surveillance capabilities, new communication capabilities, dozens and dozens of small startups that are primarily software companies that are now operating on this new space-based network and satellites. And and the number of applications there is almost unlimited. it's, It's incredible how much value is being created. You think about things like Earth observation alone. And the number of different market sectors that that kind of new information and data serves, it's uh, it's an incredible new opportunity for the future and tailor made for small startups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. As you're thinking about commercial applications of some of these things, let's talk about the moon for a second. I've heard you mention that traveling from Earth to moon and back needs to be, well, these are my words, not yours, but I'm paraphrasing, but more like a highway and less Lewis and Clark. Can you talk about what some of the specific challenges, you know, obviously takeoff and landing feels extremely important, but <laughs> what, what are some of the really important technical challenges that you think need, would need to be solved for to turn it more into that highway experience where you just don't even think about it too much? It, you're able to something that you would feel good recommending your friends and family embark on. Well, this is the exciting part about space travel that's evolving right before our eyes, Ryan. It's 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 the most exciting time in space exploration that I can remember, even going back to the Apollo days. And uh, the first step is going to be building out this low Earth orbit ecosystem that I talked about. And I think space travel in that realm will become very commonplace over the next decade or two. You already see a number of companies that are working on things like space tourism, uh, the ability to, to bring humans to the International Space Station. Uh, There's going to be a number of uh, companies that operate in that space successfully. And before too long, you're going to see low Earth orbit space travel become as common as uh, commercial airplane travel is today. Then stepping from there, the next thing is to uh, return to the moon. With NASA, there's a program underway to do that, the Artemis program, the the big rocket that's going to bring humans back to the moon, the new space launch system, that development testing is underway and uh, NASA is planning the, the first mission in uh, 2024. And uh, think about this, putting humans back on the surface of the moon, this time to stay. And I think that's one of the big big changes is to create a permanent lunar base, permanent operations that will allow the transportation, the travel between Earth and moon to become more commonplace, become a highway, as you said. And then developing a lunar gateway that can then serve as a, a gateway for deeper space exploration to things like asteroids, and then uh, ultimately putting humans on the surface of Mars. And uh, one of my favorite things to talk about back when I was at Boeing was that same space launch system rocket, which I believe will be the rocket that ultimately does take the first human to the surface of Mars. I want to ask you one last question about the moon. Then we're talking about Mars, and then I, I definitely can't let you go without talking about mining asteroids. But 69 was the first time we went to the moon. When was the last manned mission to the moon? It would have been early 70s? Early 70s, yeah. It feels, when you talk to folks from the baby boomer generation, it feels personal. You know, that was a, such a big part of their story to go. And and in a way that you know, I'm not sure like all space narratives feel, it feels like we're back. We've come full circle. We haven't been in a long time. It's a topic a lot of people touch on. Do you feel like returning to the moon is personal for you? Do you feel a personal attachment to being a part of that story? I do. I, I feel a very personal attachment to it. I still remember as a very young child uh, watching the uh, the moon landings, the Apollo landings, and just marveling, marveling at that. I had the privilege uh, uh, during my Boeing career to meet uh, Neil Armstrong and spend some time with him. What a fantastic guy, incredible man, great courage, and very humble about what he accomplished being the first human stepping foot on the moon. And uh, I was always inspired by that. It's something that inspired me throughout my entire career. And now it's it's just exciting to see us returning to that opportunity. 
as I said, not only getting back to the moon, but setting up a permanent base there. A lot of people don't realize how much of the technology from the Apollo program you know, changed so much of our lives here back on Earth over the last many decades. A lot of the, the computing technology, the IoT technology that we talked about can trace its way back to the space program, new materials, uh, new medical equipment, so many things that transformed life on Earth uh, because of the space program. And now I think we'll see a second wave of that as we go back to the moon, set up a permanent presence, go to Mars, the technology ripple, uh, the benefit back to, uh, to humans here on, uh, on the surface of the Earth is going to be extraordinary and many things that we don't even know yet. Right. So asteroids, I've heard it said that the world's first trillionaire will be, may very possibly be the guy or person that, that gets this right, that really figures out how to get in there, mine some of these, what are to us rare elements may not at all be rare in the core of, of an asteroid. Is this something that really turns your crank? Is that something that you think New Vista would be taking a hard look at is, is companies that are maybe oriented in the direction of being able to be a part of that story? Is that on you guys' radar? Yeah, I think that that's something certainly it's going to be of high interest to us over, over time. Uh, I don't see any companies that are you know ready to go public yet in that sector. There's certainly a lot of investment that's going into, into asteroid mining. And I think this whole area of deep space exploration will ultimately uh, be of commercial interest to us as well at, at New Vista. And uh, this idea of asteroid mining is, is, a, is a fantastic one, right? There, there are almost unlimited possibilities there. It could be uh, rare minerals and, 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 and uh, other capabilities that we could find on these asteroids. There are companies already uh, demonstrating the ability to rendezvous with an asteroid, land on it, be able to pick up material from the asteroid, return it to Earth. So those technologies are you know, already being developed and demonstrated. Now, the, the trick will be to do that at scale and to do it in a way that's economically viable. And uh, it's not only about going to asteroids and mining and bringing stuff back to Earth. It's also about space-based operations. So there are some who propose, for example, finding asteroids that might be rich in, uh, in ice and be able to harvest that ice and move it to the moon as a source of water on the moon, going from low gravity to low gravity. So there are all kinds of possibilities once you uh, tap into the ability to reliably and economically uh, gain access to asteroids. So my last question for you, Elon Musk has famously said that he's fine to die on Mars, just not on impact. At what point do we see Dennis Mullenberg? What is your threshold for space travel? So you're obviously very interested in investing, being close mm -hmm. to it. At what point do we see Dennis Mullenberg raise his hand and go put eyes on up close on, on something in outer space? You want to be one of the first guys in this next wave, or are you waiting to see certain safety thresholds kind of be in place? Oh, I, I want to be in that first wave for sure. So as, as soon as I can, I want to fly into low earth orbit with, without a doubt. And uh, with all the energy and investment that's going into that, I think that's going to happen fairly soon. So one of my personal goals is within the next decade, to be uh, to be flying in space and, and to be in low Earth orbit. And, uh, you know, if I could rendezvous with the International Space Station or maybe go check out the latest space factory, I'd, I'd be up for that. So that's a, your version of the Roaring Twenties. I like it. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> Dennis Mullenberg, we really appreciate you coming on the show today. Always great to see you. Appreciate it. Ryan, thanks. I enjoyed the conversation and uh, thanks for the opportunity. You got it. You shouldn't have to worry about IoT projects dragging on or unreliable vendors. You've got enough on your plate. The right team of engineers and project managers can change a pivotal moment for your business into your competitive edge. Very's close-knit crew of ambitious problem solvers, continuous improvers, and curious builders know how to turn your ideas into a reality, on time and up to your standards. With a focus on mitigating risk and maximizing opportunity, we'll help you build an IoT solution that you can hang your hat on. Let's bring your IoT idea to life. Learn more at verypossible.com. You've been listening to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player and give us a rating. Have a question or an idea for a future episode? Send it to podcast at verypossible.com. See you next time.